Well, thank you for that. And uh, now we have a, a slightly different approach to, uh, to the general uh, question of application of multiomics to observational uh, studies. You've heard four excellent talks so far with a little bit of, of, of discussion there. And what, we've, what we're now going to do is challenge four panelists uh, to within a very short period of time, five minutes each, to uh, actually answer two questions or address two questions. Uh, where do we want to be and what's the aspirational goal that we, <clears throat> we want to achieve? And what are the barriers and opportunities uh, for achieving those goals? I will point out, I'm, uh, I'm Jonathan Haynes. I'm the chair of Population and Quantitative Health Sciences at Case Western Reserve University. I've been studying a number of neurological uh, and ophthalmological diseases for uh, far too long. Um, so with that, uh, just remind, remind the speakers, they had the option of, of having some slides. So some of them will have slides, some, some may not. I will remind them that uh, I, will, I will break in and with, with the one minute point just to, to keep things uh, on time. Um, the first uh, individual, the first person to take up this challenge is uh, Dr. Miriam Fernage, who is a professor at the Center of Human Genetics and the Lawrence and Johanna Favreau uh, Distinguished Professor in Cardiology at the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston. Her research interests lie in the molecular genetics of complex diseases with an emphasis on using functional genomic and genetic uh, epidemiology strategies. Her focus is on the interaction between genes and environmental factors. And you've got five minutes to enlighten us on the challenges. Thank you, Jonathan. And thank you for the organizers for letting me uh, give my perspective uh, on uh, multiomics. Uh, let's see if I can get that, here we go. So uh, the first question we were asked was where we wanted to be. So I think I'm going to reiterate a few uh, themes that we've heard over the past couple of days. So the first thing I will say is we want a comprehensive set of omics information at a large scale. And I think that scale is going to be dependent on the question and the study design. Of course, we want a large number of people. We want multiple measures or multiple time during the lifespan, perhaps and also perhaps a different sources from single cells to uh, various tissues. Um, for, with these data, we hope to gain a comprehensive set of standardized and validated biomarkers of disease. I think um, um, Nancy started the workshop yesterday asking why there wasn't very many biomarkers, so more biomarkers used in, uh, in clinical settings. And I perhaps, uh, would offer that uh, maybe we don't have as many validated biomarkers as we should. And I wanna point some of the work we're doing as part of a MARC VCID consortium where we are trying to validate and standardize biomarkers for a vascular contribution of cognitive, to cognitive impairment and dementia. So there is some painstaking work that go into validating biomarkers and that consortium is really doing some work there. Um, with that, we definitely want to get to integrated models for disease risk and prediction uh, for disease diagnosis uh, and for therapeutic response. And so hopefully these uh, integrated model uh, would, be would have an established clinical use in diverse population. And finally, uh, the, the goal is really to have a routine application and adoption of these models in clinical settings and with integration of uh, clinical tools and EHR. So that would be the aspiration in my, in my view. Uh, some needs and challenges and barrier. So I think each individual omics present its own set of challenges. And of course, multi-omics will inherit all of these and face additional challenges of harmonization and integration of heterogeneous and high dimensional data. So I think we do a good job of identifying confounders and unwanted source of variation and biases across a single omics. And so I think we have to carry that to uh, multiple layers of data. Uh, one of the challenges as well is to have uh, interoperable uh, omic data resources and ontologies, sometimes annotation of molecule across platform within a, an omic, much less across different layers of omics is, is sometimes difficult. So having standardization there would be helpful. Um, we've 
heard a little bit about advanced computational met methods that account and for and leverage the complex interrelationship between and with genomics. I think those are crucial. Uh, we, for that, we need suitable computing infrastructure for data storage and management. And of course, these advanced, uh, advanced computational methods such as machine learning, deep learning, uh, will, which require specialized expertise and training and therefore uh, multidisciplinary team science is definitely uh, the, the, uh, the needed here. The next step of a challenge I thought was also the need for accessing this information at large scale. And so uh, I think that requires consortia wide effort for data harmonization and curation. Uh, not only shared data, but perhaps shared workflow and also a computing infrastructure. So I think, for example, in TopMed, in Charge, we've been using uh, computing infrastructure that, for example, uh, in the, the commons, the biodata catalyst, that those are the type of infrastructure that definitely will be needed uh, at large scale. And finally, uh, in that same realm, uh, public portals, I think we want to engage larger communities of researchers and clinicians and stakeholder. And so those are definitely something that we should think of. One minute. Uh, so for additional needs, the need for tissues, disease specific data set, and the need to translate omics knowledge into cl clinically effective models for prediction. And that's for all. Uh, so we're gonna need standard and best practice in developing and reporting these risk models um, and, and validated again, validated model across multiple population. And ideally these models would be integrated into clinical tools. In terms of opportunities, I think we all recognize that multi-omics uh, are more, uh, more than the sum of, sum of each omics. And so uh, we need to integrate these multi-omics to en enhance our ability to understand causal relationship. And so we have um, genetics is very helpful in, these, in this setting, using a Mendelian randomization uh, and also layering XQTL mapping, for example, layering omics into GWAS to understand causal genes. Um, I think we understand also that the value of multi-omics for disease increases when it's integrated in environmental, social, and lifestyle exposure, the exposome over the lifespan. Um, and so I, I think we have to have an effort to, to really having uh, this integration. And so I think that's where the longitudinal epidemiological cohorts that are exposure driven in their data collection can be very helpful. And so finally, we have a decade of GWAS studies have, have given us uh, the value of open science and data sharing and consortia based collaboration. I think there is very good model for those. I think we should uh, continue on, on this realm. And again, uh, getting back to using more effective and meaningful predictive model in clinical setting, I think we can build on what we uh, uh, were starting to do in polygenic risk score, uh, but uh, perhaps supplement them with various panels of validated biomarker that reflect the lifestyle, lifespan or the life stage and um, the disease stage and, and exposures, for example. Uh, certainly for these models, we're gonna have to take advantage of computational methods, advanced such as uh, uh, machine learning, deep learning, and above all, uh, we need to keep the focus on addressing health disparities and improving on, on our diversity uh, focus. So I'll stop here and let my colleagues continue. Thank you for that. And to remind folks, we are going to have the four panelists each talk, and then we will have about 25 minutes or so to have questions. So if you have questions that come along, you can put them in the chat, and then we'll have the open discussion after that. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the next panelist. Uh, Dr. Adam Buttonworth is a reader in molecular epidemiology in the Department of Public Health and Primary Care at the University of Cambridge, where his, his interests are in molecular epidemiology and revolve around the identification of genetic variation linked with coronary disease and related phenotypes in molecular omics, such as plasma, proteomics, and metabolomics. Five minutes, off you go. Thanks very much, Jonathan, and uh, thanks to the organizers for the invitation to join this wonderful meeting. Um, it's uh, attracted me on a, on a Friday night here in the, the rainy UK, so um, thank you for listening. Um, so uh, why am I here? Well, my group spent much of the past 10 years uh, working on a study called Interval, which is a, a cohort of 50,000 largely healthy people from the UK, over which we've really tried to elucidate the path from DNA to disease. Um, so anchored in genomic information and with linkages to e-health records on, on disease status, we've tried a variety of different platforms that you see uh, here um, in blood and plasma-based uh, measurements. 
um, particularly around the proteomics and, and the metabolomics, uh, really trying to understand the pathway from, from DNA to disease. More recently, in the last couple of years, we've kind of nationalized this effort uh, by pulling together a, a 13 now population cohorts that again have genomic data, health record data, and some form of multi-omics data with the idea of, of scaling and, and uh, understanding reproducibility across cohorts that's, uh, that's been mentioned several times. Because these are population-based, we can look at uh, largely at things like prediction of incident disease outcomes, but also trying to understand the etiology and, and causal uh, pathways to disease rather than, for example, stratification of patients. So uh, inspired by Eric Green's uh, bold predictions uh, for, for genomics, um, I thought uh, the way to present my vision of, of what we might see in the next uh, decade or so is, is the bold prediction for multiomics and cohorts. And I won't go through all of this in detail, but uh, just to pick up a few of the points, uh, diversity has, of course been mentioned. I think there's a role here for both patient and population cohorts. Uh, you've heard several people talk about the idea of serial measurements rather than what we mostly have in populations, which is cross-sectional measurements. I think uh, multiomic layers will be important. We've seen the more layers you have, um, the more information one can glean. Um, and we're largely, you know, really only touching the tip of the iceberg with blood and plasma. So how do we get into, uh, for example, different cell types, tissues, et cetera. Um, as has just been mentioned, I, I think making the data widely accessible is a key point here and, and uh, be used for the field. Of course, we need to make sure it's safely stored and managed. And of course, we're going to, uh, as this data continue to grow, we're really going to require novel ways of thinking about this so we can really understand the complexity here. Um, let me show you a few examples of why I think this is uh, important. Um, my group doesn't focus so much on aging, but uh, Benoit Lallier and, and Tony Wiskeray at Stanford are interested in because we made a data from uh, the interval study open uh, to people, they, uh, they applied and accessed our data. Uh, and we're interested in looking at aging and the proteome and identifying peaks of aging and proteins that go up and down. Uh, one example I see here on the right is, is MMP12, which is a, a plasma protein level seem to go up in the peaks uh, that they identified at 60 and, and 78. So it seems to increase as we age. Um, and others had looked at this and shown that uh, MMP12 levels seem to be positively associated with both primary and recurrent cardiovascular events. So the higher your levels, the higher your risk of a uh, heart attack or similar. But when we use genetic data and, and anchored that in genomic information using the interval study, we identified that people who carry alleles that uh, give them higher plasma MMP12 levels actually seem to have lower risk. So we think this is actually a protective biomarker. Uh, it's re released in response to, to, to myocardial damage. Um, and therefore, that gives you quite a different slant on uh, the, the relationship between biomarker and, and disease. I think there is a causal effect, but it's potentially in the opposite direction to what you'd see with just a, a longitudinal study. So we think longitudinal studies are important to capture that information before disease onset, but also anchoring in genomics for causality is, uh, is useful too. Multiple platforms, I think uh, maybe with genomics and then perhaps transcriptomics and some of the earlier stage uh, technologies were, were uh, more standardized, more advanced. I think with proteomics and metabolomics, one thing we've learned is that you know, findings are often comparable across proteins. This is looking at PQTLs uh, for, for two different plasma um, protein platforms we used. There is a good correlation, but not all the case. And you see in kind of the horizontal and the vertical here, there are some exceptions. Uh, for example, this uh, CIS-PQTL for a protein GDF15, which has a clear and striking signal in one platform, but a P of 0.5 in the other platform, completely different signals. And I think we're only just starting to really understand the differences. And so using multiple platforms is going to be, uh, it's going to be important. Um, finally, to some barriers, uh, clearly um, cost of this, uh, gen uh, genome sequences come down dramatically, but not yet for proteins and metabolites in the same way. So I think coordinated efforts, uh, these are scalable, um, making sure these are scalable and driving the cost down. Much of our uh, omics were funded by industry. So I think uh, partnering there is gonna be important. I've mentioned already going beyond blood. We're just getting this snapshot with uh, peripheral blood. Uh, often the action is somewhere else and we don't know how what's going on in blood relates to the, the tissue we're interested in. So that's clearly gonna be important. Everybody argues we need more of these things. Uh, one of the challenges is where to prioritize. Is it more samples, more time points, more layers? Um, and finally, how do we ensure we get that diversity uh, and diversity at scale and diversity that's not uh, um, tokenistic or, or uh, sufficiently powered to, to tell us. So I'll leave you uh, just with my bold prediction. Thank you. Thank you. That's very, very informative.
Uh, our next panelist to take up the challenge uh, is Dr. Greg Gibson. He's the Patton Distinguished Professor in the School of Biological Sciences and Director of the Center for Integrative Genomics and a member of the Pettit Institute for Bioengineering and Biosciences at Georgia uh, Institute of Technology. His research interests, interests lie in the uh, use of transcriptomics for personalized medicine, predictive health, and, and predictive health. And Greg, you're off. Thank you very much, Jonathan, and thank you to the organizers. It's uh, wonderful to be here. It's been a great uh, workshop. I want to make four points. I think whether or not there are opportunities or challenges depends on your perspective. I think there are a bit of both. So the first one is that I think um, we should have much more focus on uh, therapeutic outcomes. I mean, predictive health is terrific, but from a patient perspective, using omics to uh, understand how they're going to respond and how the disease is going to progress is important. So here's just an example. Uh, if you take um, on the y-axis, a uh, sort of a classical histological measure of, of, of Crohn's activity index. Um, on the x-axis is a, is a transcriptomic signature of disease progression and Crohn's disease. Either of them alone are reasonably, reasonably good, but taken together, um, they give you much better prediction. In this case, in the bottom left quadrant here, we see almost nobody who's going to progress to the disease, such as the blue, blue dots. Um, the other point about so so these these different types of measures are, are somewhat orthogonal, but working them together, they can give you much better evidence about outcomes. And the other thing about this is that therapeutic outcomes are usually 20 or 30 or 40, 50 percent of the population, which is going to give you much better precision or positive predictive value um, than if you're only looking at something like disease incidence when it's only two or three or five percent. Um, so focusing resources on reducing things like the number needed to treat is a, a clear opportunity. Uh, the second point I wanted to make is that um, omic measures are a lot closer to disease than genotypes themselves. So if you take, take a typical EQTL, for example, where you have maybe a protective allele from GWAS and a susceptible genotype combination from GWAS, if you're doing genetic risk scores, you base, you, you're based on just the genotypes. But if you think that actually what the genotype is doing is regulating gene expression, then it turns out that most people with the risk genotype have perfectly normal gene expression. So an orthogonal thing to do is to say, well, let's look at the risk based on transcriptomes. And if you do that, it actually turns out that you can, you can get much, much better predictors. Um, and on the right is an example, which we've got in pre, uh, uh, under review of predicting ulcerative colitis from uh, rectal gene expression, where we see uh, really, really good uh, discrimination of colectomy cases, almost 50% prediction by transcriptomics, which you'd never ever get um, with just genotypes alone, although we can actually generate a, a genotypic score from the EQTL that regulate those genes as well. Um, the third thing uh, running through quickly that I wanted to sort of say is we need to remember that all risk assessments uh, are very much context dependent. So here are examples from the UK Biobank where we've just split um, the Biobank into two halves based on healthy versus unhealthy environment, whether it's obesity, heart, CAD, type 2 diabetes, IBD, in every single case, the environment has a dramatic impact on your risk assessments. And I think this will be no different for multi-omic assessments than it is for genetic risk scores. So in a, in a typical example, you're seeing, for example, that the, uh, so this is a, a prevalence risk plot um, where your risk, your prevalence goes up as your uh, percentile of um, uh, the risk score goes up. But in, these t in the different environments, um, Typically, somebody in the 25th percentile in a bad environment has the same risk as somebody in the 75th percentile in a good environment. And those sorts of environments can be actual physical environments. They can be socioeconomic status. And of course, they can be um, uh, ancestry-based uh, differences. So, so we've really got to be cognizant of the impact of not just ancestry, but all sorts of uh, inputs we've heard many, much, many times this week um, or the last two days uh, on, on disparities in health um, when we do our assessments, we just, we just need to take into account that those assessments have to be um, informed by our environmental background. And then the final uh, point I wanted to make is that I, I think uh, that actually single cell genomics adds, adds, adds a great deal to us. Um, so this is some data gathered with Judy Cho and, and Subhika Gathasan and others and the Inflammatory Bowel Disease Consortium. And we can do our single cell profiling in this case of the epithelium um, of the um, uh, ileum of patients with Crohn's disease. And when we actually go in and we look at the genes which are uh, both GWAS associated with disease, so they're probably causal and they're differentially expressed between patients and uh, healthy controls, 
we actually see by doing a single cell transcriptomics which cell types uh, are involved. And so they're, they're, they're not all cell types. So for example, uh, IBD is not a B cell disease, but we do see involvement of dendritic cells and inflammatory um, immunoregulatory T cells. And we actually also see some um, engagement of epithelial cells. Um, that's great. We, we may be able to get there as Tully was arguing yesterday from deconvolution, but what you probably won't be able to get there is, um, is looking at patient specific responses. And I don't have it on this slide, but it turns out that if we go in, we can actually look at individual patients and see that either the cell type or genes within particular cell types are perturbed in very much patient specific manners. And I think only the single cell profiling is about the only way that we're going to get to that level of resolution, which you can then turn, take that a step further and say, well, if this is the source of your pathology, then this is a sort of uh, therapeutic um, regimen that you need to be able to get, whether it's directing it at goblet cells or at, at, at immune cells or whatever. And, and Mike uh, Schneider had a great example of that in diabetes yesterday from his own profiling. So if I was to uh, sort of make some, some broad um, suggestions, it would be, first of all, that I think we, as many have said, we need more support for consortium-based multiomic data acquisition, preferably longitudinally and preferably multi-tissue. Um, I really think that the integration of multiomics must be done in the context of the patient's environment, which includes socioeconomic, it includes diet, it includes microbiome, um, and includes ethnicity and, and ancestry. And I think that we need to pay much more attention to precision over accuracy. So forecasting patient outcomes. Um, so accuracy is, is uh, sensitivity and specificity. Precision is positive predictive value. And, and I'd love to see in the next few years that we're using multiomics to improve uh, the, the predictive value of, of our genetic evaluations. All right, thank you very much. Uh, and the, the uh, last but not least panelist to take up the challenge is Dr. Allison Goat, who is the professor of neuroscience and director of the Ronald Loeb Center for Alzheimer's Disease at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. Her uh, research focuses on dementia and addiction with the aim of understanding the molecular basis of disease and ultimately identifying novel targets for therapeutic development. And she, of course, uses multiomics to uh, get make progress in that area. So, Allison, take it away. Uh, hopefully you can see the right set of slides. Um, okay, yes, so yes. Um, as Jonathan said, my focus is really on neurologic and psychiatric diseases. And so my, my first point really is around access to the relevant relevant tissues for this group of diseases. And, and you can see here, this is looking at SNP heritability across a range of neurologic and psychiatric diseases, taking different cell types from, from within the brain. And I, I think sort of pretty stark contrast actually for Alzheimer's disease, you can see this is really uh, in, in microglial enhances the SNP heritability, whereas across a range of, oh, sorry about that. Um, of uh, psychiatric and, and behavioral disorders, there's broader evidence of heritability across different cell types. And the reason this I think is really important is microglia represent a very small percentage of total, uh, total brain cell types and therefore bulk data from the brain doesn't get you anywhere at all in terms of being able to understand the disease. And, uh, and so, you know, single cell data sets, I would argue, is something that are particularly uh, important in, in, this, in this context. Uh, importantly, we, we and others have found that there's a lot of um, overlap between the, the uh, enhances in microglia and in peripheral myeloid cells. And, and indeed, when you sort of use peripheral myeloid data, you can actually help to understand a lot of the genetics of Alzheimer's disease, but not all. And I think that that's really the important thing that maybe there's 50% of the loci from these GWAS studies that we cannot assign genes to the locus. And I think it's very likely that there are you know, specific uh, differences in, in this microglial population that we don't pick up in peripheral macrophages or, or in monocytes. And, and so we, one of our, I think, problems is that we really, it's even hard to get to gene discovery because of lack of data for the, for the cell types that are most important uh, for understanding 
the disease. And so, you know, so if we want to understand molecular mechanisms there, we need to have much uh, better, better quality data, uh, even from the right tissue and the right cell types and across diverse populations in order for us to be able to understand this. Uh, and the same is going to be true. Uh, so we need this information if we want to be able to develop novel therapeutics or diagnostics and, uh, and biomarkers. And right now, certainly in Alzheimer's disease, you know, we have very few biomarkers. Up until very recently, the ones in cerebral spinal fluid have been the ones that have largely been used. I have to say there is promise there now in terms of plasma biomarkers. And so uh, certainly anything that we can do with peripheral tissue that will help us will make things a lot easier than if we uh, need brain tissue, because clearly this is not an organ that's accessible to us until people die. And that, that's sort of a significant problem in trying to disentangle cause from effect in, in these things. And that's really, right now, most of our omics data does come from bulk uh, brain for, uh, uh, obtained at, at autopsy. And I think that's a significant limitation, right? So I think that we need, certainly we need more single cell data, uh, but we need um, purified cell, uh, cell data uh, and we need a lot uh, more different types of data in order to understand uh, this underlying uh, genetic risk. In terms of opportunities, I think, so thinking about um, longitudinal studies, uh, I mean, also all the sorts of omics data that people have mentioned, I do think, you know, obviously we, we will need CSF uh, and brain, but otherwise blood, uh, uh, omics from blood is, is obviously the most accessible and, and clearly going to be broadly uh, useful. I think you need longitudinal studies, you need good and deep phenotype data uh, and uh, genetic data to identify novel biomarkers. Uh, the examples I've given here are specifically to AD, but I want to or, um, illustrate particular things. So the first two examples are longitudinal observational studies in fa families with known causes of disease. And, and I think we shouldn't forget that there is some value in being able to look at these because we know who's going to get disease. We know when they're going to get disease. Uh, and so we can do longitudinal studies in these people uh, and, and, uh, and they're very motivated to participate because they're in uh, high risk families. And so there's a lot of value for those kinds of families. We also have, you know, sort of late onset uh, families uh, as well, where there are large cohorts. And then there are case control data sets, some with longitudinal data. Uh, and uh, where we could collect omics data. And then the last example is obviously biobanks where I think there's also uh, great potential and the idea of using polygenic risk scores within large biobanks to be able to identify at-risk individuals and to be able to uh, collect large-scale omics data longitudinally uh, in these kinds of samples. And, and in addition, I would and in addition to these omics samples, I, I would argue that, that we should be banking um, IPS lines or at least PBMCs from these pa uh, from patients so that we have uh, we have cell, we have lines that we can differentiate into any cell type that may be useful for the disease that we're interested in, that we can do omics on those cell types. Uh, and we can study uh, function and use them also, if we have diverse panels, use them for drug screening uh, as well. So I think there's some uh, great value in having uh, not a omics from fluids, but collecting cells from people as well. So I'll stop there, thanks. All right, thank you very much. Thank you to all four of the, the panelists. I would ask that the panelists uh, come on and come on the video so you have an opportunity to, um, everyone can have the opportunity to see you and ask questions. So we have approximately 20 minutes for questions for our panelists. So anyone who has a question, uh, raise your hand. Um, 
uh, write in the chat or um, speak up. So, Eric. Thanks. Allison, that was great. I would enthusiastically agree with the first half about the relevant cell types and tissues needing more data. But I guess I worry that we're rather naive that we don't know what the relevant cell types and tissues are for most late onset chronic diseases. We, we think we know some of them. And well, first of all, I don't think there's one. And second, we think we know some of them. And I worry sometimes the cell types and tissues that we point to are the cell types and tissues of the symptoms, not so much the causality. Uh, I mean, I would agree with you that I think for like, the many diseases, we don't know the uh, most of where most of the SNP heritability is because we've been using bulk tissues. And if any of the, the risk is, is in cell types that represent minor cell types, then we're probably missing it uh, altogether. But I, I think it's a really important component of trying to understand the diseases to know uh, the contribution of, of different cell types, at least from my own perspective, I was, I had a very neuro or neuronal centric view of Alzheimer's disease until about six or seven years ago. Uh, and, and now maybe I'm proselytizing like the, the newly converted, but it, it sort of, I think it really opened my eyes to, yeah, how biased we can be about thinking about a disease if we're thinking about it based on symptomatology without really thinking about the the causal role of particular cells. So I, I think it's really an argument for single cell data, right? That yeah. with bulk data, it's extremely difficult to get beyond the most common cell type uh, in, in that tissue. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Judy, I think you're next. Um, okay. Um, I had two questions, one for Greg and one for Allison. For Greg, it was interesting that diet seemed to have the least effect of inflammatory bowel disease. Um, did you look at Crohn's versus ulcerative colitis and kind of how scalable is that? And for Allison, kind of smart watches or devices plus Alzheimer's? Yeah, well, I know, who wants to go first? <laughs> I can if you like. Uh, I do think that Passive data collection in an Alzheimer population is going to be better than an active one, right? In the sense that, you know, as you, as the disease develops, you're not going to be actively entering data, but definitely wearables where you can collect data, I think can be uh, very valuable, right? I mean, I think sort of um, loss, sort of bare subtle behavioral changes can be picked up with, with, wearables and even collecting mem uh, memory data more frequently has been shown to be much more valuable than collecting memory or more accurate than collecting memory data once a year when someone feels really stressed because they're coming in for their test. Even people who are you know, in the non-demented but at risk feel very stressed by doing a memory test and anything could make that that are poor, whereas if you're collecting data, you know, on a smartphone or something every week or every few months, a couple of months or something, you're gonna get a much better picture actually of, of what the real state of someone's memory is. So yeah, definitely I think that there's uh, a lot of value in, in having wearables and for data collection or just smart data collection generally, right? Rather than just a, a clinical interview once a year. Um, so, so Judy, I'll send you the paper, the preprint we put on BioArchive in the next couple of weeks. But um, yes, there are differences between UC and CD in the environmental impacts on the polygenic risk assessment. Um, you know, nicotine and alcohol consumption are big factors that, that really discriminate individuals. Um, but it gets to this idea of condition, conditionality. Actually, um, you know, dried fruit and fresh fruit consumption produce different results, but I don't, I doubt that fruit consumption itself is the important thing. I think they're markers more generically of the type of diet one has. The other component that comes into all of these factors is actual familial um, 
disease, presence of disease as well. And I think that's probably partly genetic, but I think it's also um, other aspects of the shared familial environment, but, but actually having a shared relative with a disease has a major, major impact on, on um, your, your relationship between prevalence and polygenic risk in, in ways that we didn't necessarily expect uh, all along. Um, and I was going to actually add to the discussion before your question, the other th it's not just finding the right cell type in my view, but it's finding it in the right circumstance. So, so a B cell or a T cell you know, in, in the gut is not the same as a B cell or a T cell in the lung or a B cell and a T cell circulating in the blood. And it's certainly not the same as one at diagnosis as somebody in, 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 uh, with established disease. So I think we need to be doing that sort of profiling, not just longitudinally in the sense of following patients, but at different time points and different conditions so that we actually get a full spectrum of what the uh, environmental impacts are on, on the profiles that we generate. Thanks. Okay, uh, Tiago. Um, thank you very much. So I'd like to bring up um, a topic that I think is really important and I haven't seen somebody you know, tackle this directly. And so this was alluded to yesterday by you know, Nancy Cox and Tuli uh, Lapalainen, where they basically, I think Nancy was more focusing on the importance of multi-omics to identify new biomarkers. And then Tuli was very much talking about the importance of single cell resolution, cell specificity, et cetera. And I think that it might be important to discuss the considerations that need to be taken into account for, you know, for example, at study design and also technologies used uh, uh, based on, you know, uh, in relation to what your goal actually is. Is your goal to understand disease etiology from a really sort of mechanistic perspective, or is it to identify biomarkers? Because I think that uh, it's particularly in a clinical setting, I think it's really important to uh, think what kind of technologies and analyses and computational tools we need uh, uh, in order to address these. So I was wondering if the panel could discuss this a little bit, basically, how can we use multiomics to uh, identify biomarkers versus disease mechanism? And are these incompatible or not? So, so maybe I can start. I mean, one observation I'd make is I don't think they're really separable. So, so when we did our transcriptional risk score study on IBD a few years ago, a, a part of it that, that really struck us was this, what we call difference between um, coherent and incoherent associations which I think was really getting at mechanisms. So, so what this is, is that uh, you'd expect in an EQTL uh, where, where the risk allele increases expression, you'd expect to see ex increased expression in cases relative contr to controls. But very often you didn't see that. In fact, it was the opposite way around and that made us scratch our heads. But, it, but our, our interpretation of it is that in fact, what, what this combined data is telling us is that in some cases that elevated expression is actually protecting the individual. Or, and, and, and if, you, if you have the allele that sends you in the opposite direction, then you can't protect yourself enough. So it's telling us that GWAS associations are sometimes uh, not promoting disease, but they're part of the protective response. So I think in that combined effort of trying to get biomarkers that were predicting disease progression, we were getting insight into the mechanism of what was going on. And so I, you know, that's part of my response is that I think that I agree with you that different algorithms are gonna give different answers for different types of questions, but they're not separable processes. Yeah. I would like just to add very quickly, because my, my point was, for example, I see a lot of studies, multiomic studies that, for example, use uh, whole blood traditionally. So, you know, tissues that are easy to access, but then they're studying, let's say, neuropsychiatric diseases. And it's not so it's not always clear in multiomics studies that people are using the tissue that is the most relevant for the particular disease they're studying. And sometimes frustratingly, you know, these studies don't find anything, but, and I was, I would just, I would want, you know, ideally to hear from you whether, should we still be using whole blood for, you know, should we, you know, should we just go full on on single cell analyses? Uh, what do you think? Well, I guess, so Tiago, one response to that is, is the recent uh, Alzheimer data where, you know, plasma levels of phospho tau look like they're as sensitive, if not more sensitive, than measuring the, sa the same protein in cerebral spinal fluid or, or imaging related proteins. So um, 
I think that that would would argue that while you might not intuitively think it's the best place to be looking for a, a marker of a neurological psychiatric disease, it can actually come up with things that are, that are very powerful. I would agree with that. And I think we've found uh, signals in blood for, you know, particularly when we think about proteins, where maybe the, uh, uh, the single cell and the, the, the cell type specific, uh, uh, you know, hasn't, uh, hasn't necessarily come as, uh, come as far, or at least in as large sample sizes that one can pick up signals that you wouldn't expect to see maybe in, in blood, but it points you, you know, towards an etiological pathway and disease that you can then follow up in, in tissue. I think to your first point, Tiago, I, I completely agree. And I think we've heard during the last two days that, uh, it really depends on the type of question you want to ask. And if you're looking at, you know, response to treatments, uh, then you're maybe going to take a, you know, a patient cohort. We heard from Mike Schneider about, you know, thinking about this idea about uh, people's veering off their trajectory, moving away from wellness into to kind of health conditions. I think if you want to then think about, you know, predicting disease, then you want kind of incident uh, kind of longitudinal cohorts. So I absolutely agree. We're going to, you know, it's, there's no single answer here. It depends on the question you want and, and design is crucial to that. Yeah. Okay, we'll move on. Uh, Phil, you had a question. Uh, thanks, Jonathan. So uh, maybe a question for Miriam and uh, Alison uh, and for the other panels, but maybe I think using uh, Alzheimer's and the brain as an example, you know, to what extent do you think that we, we can take it, we can leverage the existing studies you know, to, to generate this type of multiomic data versus designing the proper study that we may want to do today based on the main things we've learned you know, in the past decade or two, uh, when a lot of the cohort studies were already going on and you know, were again designed to do other things. And in particular, I would say the big divide is the, the separation between the end organ sort of data that we get from autopsy material, in this case, the brain, uh, versus the, uh, the fluid biomarker, the fluid data that we can get from CSF and blood, which are on different subjects, typically much younger than the individuals from whom we get the brains? Yeah, that's a difficult question, uh, Phil. Uh, so I, I think there may be some advantages in, in using the cohort of, uh, that we have uh, for convenience. Uh, certainly having um, multiple omics on the same person um, is probably going to be advantageous versus cobbling together uh, omics from uh, participants, um, a set of participants that may or may not be similar to another set of participants on which you'll have a uh, different set of omics. So uh, I, I think that's that's a major, that would be a major advantage is having to comprehensive set of omics on a decent amount of participants, all of them. Uh, and, um, and obviously that set of participants would be uh, selected based on the question you're asking, right? So uh, for some, question it may be that longitudinal cohort uh, may be appropriate for some others, maybe that the, um, the data, the, the samples that we have on uh, Alzheimer's disease patients may be uh, more appropriate. Uh, but that's a, that's a different, that's a very difficult question to address. Um, if we have to do something de novo, I think uh, we better think clearly in our study design and the question you want to ask to make those dec decisions rationally. Uh, but for existing data, I think there is also a merit of, of putting together existing data that's already been collected. Um, but again, I think that's the, the harmonization uh, is going to be very difficult. But, uh, you know, that, that's at zero cost. It's already been collected. So I think there, there is some merit as well into looking into trying to harmonize uh, this type of data to ask reasonable questions. Yeah, I, I don't think I really have much to add. I mean, I, I, I agree in both ways that I think that, that um, ideally, I think you want the, the different omics data sets on the same individual and that may necessitate as, uh, as you know, collecting either new data on existing cohorts or creating uh, new cohorts, but I, I I mean, I, I think for just from a very practical point of view, some investment does need to be made in, in trying to uh, harmonize and, and optimize what we currently have as well, because we will learn some things from that. And maybe that will lead us to design better studies 
uh, for the next the next uh, generation of studies. But I, we definitely need these kinds of data on the same individuals. And I, I do think one of the challenges in Alzheimer's disease and what we have so far is that it's mainly from dead people, right? Uh, and yeah, we just we said earlier about how it's probably got a twenty year course of disease. So I think that that that's a real challenge in this field that we really need some data from existing longitudinal cohorts where we can sample people at different points in the disease. And that's what I tried to illustrate actually at the end of my talk with the suggestion of some of these, uh, you know, sort of certainly rare forms of the disease, but predictable in terms of when they're gonna onset disease and, and who's gonna get disease and collecting omics in, in those kinds of families might be extremely valuable. Okay, we're running up on the on on the hour. I'm going to give Jihang the chance to ask her ask the last question, and then I think we're due for a little bit of a break, if I'm if I remember correctly. So, Jihang. Thanks so much, Anderson. Uh, great discussions. My questions is about how to effectively design multi omic study in longitudinal studies, in particular. Ideally, we want to sample everybody and in the whole cohort, think about like a, um, of, of us, uh, a million people and get the multi-omic data at, for example, yearly of multi-omic data for everybody. But in reality, this is not possible. And so we need to uh, sample a subset of people. Then how can we effectively sample a subset of people in multi-omic study to, um, help with the scientific goal we are interested in as a panelist that discussed. And so the a, 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 a traditional way is in genomic study is to do random sample. But in epidemiological study, we know this is not effective way and uh, it's a not powerful way to use the, the limited funding to do. So for example, in epidemiological study, when we'll use like case cohort design. And so suppose you have for each in each new case, and then for those people at risk, at risk cut, you random sample a subgroup of people. And so this will in, uh, improve the power because you will sample enough uh, cases as time move on, and also you have sufficient controls. So, but this type of uh, efficient epidemiological design has not been used much in uh, genetic genomic studies. I want to get the thoughts from the panelists, how can we encourage incorporating those more efficient epidemiological designs in designing the multi-omic study in longitudinal settings. I think that's a key challenge uh, you hit on there and there's different approaches. You know, one is to take the uh, sort of UK biobank approach, which is to say everyone's got their own pet disease of interest. So you, you either measure something in everybody or in a, a, a random sample. So you don't favor any particular disease, but of course that has, has limitations. Uh, I think the, the, the rationale for doing that is to avoid the piecemeal approach whereby different parts of your cohort have different multi-omics data because everybody's interested in a different disease and then you end up with this sort of patchwork that you can't uh, knit together. But, you know, I think if you want factors to look at, I think uh, PRS, as, as somebody mentioned earlier, I think there's a lot of interest now in uh, identifying either uh, related family members or people with high polygen at risk as uh, in the age, as, as people said, for Alzheimer's as well, hitting the age bracket that you want. So I think there are ways to enrich, but I think as, you know, if you're thinking about a, a large population cohort or a, uh, even a patient cohort, how you do that so you don't end up with a piecemeal jigsaw is, um, can be quite a challenge. Okay, I think we uh, we've we've unfortunately run out of time, and there I'm sure would be more questions and, and more answers, and we could talk about this for a long period of time. But uh, we are due for a short break at this point, I think. So I'm going to turn it back over to Joe and Ellen, Aaron, and uh, they can take it away. Thanks, Jonathan. Yes, we are due for a break right now. And um, everybody come back at 315. We would encourage you to keep uh, connected to Zoom so that, um, so that we don't have to let everybody back in. So go take a break and come back at 315. Thank you.